Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Sometimes a book comes out that so closely coincides with the news that it surprises me, but it really shouldn't because this happens all the time. I regularly speak with students about the Gilded Age, and they say that this relates so closely to our current context. And on this very show, I interviewed Scott Reynolds Nelson a couple years ago about Ukraine grain shipments, and that happened on the very day that Putin's army invaded Ukraine. Today, I'm interviewing Rebecca Claren, the award-winning journalist who's written extensively about the American West, and she's written most poignantly on the environment, although her portfolio sprawls into Native American rights, feminism, agriculture, consumer rights. You'll find her work in places like Mother Jones, High Country News, The Nation, and Salon. She's also written a novel in 2018, but of all of that, the most important thing is her latest book, for the Gilded Age at least anyway. It's a personal, non-fiction genealogy of sorts that grapples with Jewish homesteaders in South Dakota. Her family, in fact, on the American frontier. And it also, obviously, relates to the displacement of Native American peoples. It's aptly called The Cost of Free Land. Jews, Lakota, and an American inheritance. And I think you can guess the contemporary relevance. Since October 7th, days after Rebecca's book came out, Hamas kidnapped over a thousand Israelis and instigated the latest violence in the Middle East. No other news story has dislodged it from the headlines, and the relevance to the Claren family story is fascinating. So let's get right into it. Welcome to the show, Becca. Awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm really excited to talk to you because I when I saw your book, I didn't initially think that it was going to be so important for today, but I think it really is. And we've only just met, although as I was saying to you just before we started, I feel like I know you a lot better because this is a personal story. This is a story about your family um, and, a, and a part of the world that you cover in some depth as a journalist. And I have to start with a question that immediately came to mind as I was reading the book and it's a story about Jewish immigrants to the United States, the displacement of Native Americans and the Lakota specifically on the American frontier. And, you know, the news at the moment from the Middle East is 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 devastating. And yeah. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about how your book tackles some of the questions that we're dealing with today in places like the Middle East and Israel and Palestine. I love that this is your first softball question. It's perfect. Let's get I know. into it. I never do this, but I thought this is a question that I we can't skirt, right? No, I mean, my book came out October 3rd, and I have done 22 events since then. And 21 of them have been since October 7th. So no, you're not the first person to, to ask this question. And I have to say... Yeah, I, I hear you. It's I'm devastated and I am angry and so many feelings. And I wish that my book that, you know, I didn't write this book to be sort of a comparative study of Israel and America or the Middle East and America. And I do think the histories aren't perfectly the same, of course, at all, especially since so many Jews consider themselves native to Israel, which is a very big difference when we're talking about land and displacement. Um, and there's no way any white person in America could say they were native to America. That said, you know, the way there, of course, are rhymes and resonances between my book and what is happening. And a lot of people have been kindly writing to me and saying that my book is it's a, even though my book is like what I would say, call it like the opposite of a beach read. I mean, I think there's two jokes in the whole thing, but like they're saying that it's fine. They're finding it uplifting to read at the moment. And I, I took me a long time to understand why. But what I think is that there might be two things. One, just the very fact that I, as an, a descendant of Jewish homesteaders, of Jewish and American immigrants, I'm grappling with this history in a really real way. I am a journalist by training. I've been a reporter for 23 years. This is maybe one of the first times I'm really stepping into the story in a very direct way, which is a bit vulnerable and uncomfortable. 
as you can imagine as a historian, and yet it felt very important to do. So there's real grappling with the past and there's real um, engagement with what we do about it today. And we can get into that more if you want. And I think maybe that's why people are finding this book sort of a balm is that there's an opportunity, hopefully in the future for uh, people in that are involved in the conflict in the Middle East to sort of step towards repair, I hope. But what I also think is, and the other thing that I, I can't help but hear, I hear so much dehumanizing language coming out of both Hamas and the IDF. And it's so clear to me that that is the same exact kind of language that the United States used to describe Native Americans for centuries. And all that dehumanizing language gets used to to commit murder, to to kill people and justify that killing or assimilating cultural genocide. And I, one of the things I take away from writing this book is that studying histories of oppression, studying the histories of each other in conflicts is a tool for empathy. It's a tool to fight against that dehumanizing language and see each other as real humans that come from messy, contextual, nuanced places. So um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I feel like that's what I've that's what I have to share about it. And I, I also guess I'll say that I think in a depress in a more depressing vein, you know, land, who has it and who doesn't, is a very primal human conflict. And it it's the it's the one to me that we have here in the world. And so in a very sad way, it feels like, okay, here we go again, fighting over land and all that comes with it. And it's it's awful, right? So it is. And I want to come back to that uh that the role that we can play as writers in our in our current in our contemporary context because I think you you end your book with a call to action but I'm doing you a massive disservice by asking that question first but I felt <laughs> I, I I had to because it was like I wanted to get the elephant in the room in you know everyone to see it before we we kick off but as, as I said this is a personal story for you and you write a prologue that sort of sets all this up and I thought it would be good to allow you to to make the case that you make in the prologue so eloquently tell us how you discovered your family history i grew up hearing stories my family are storytellers they tell stories in a kind of bananas way many of them they like every story is like here's the thing i'm going to tell you but let me take a left turn and then a really long right turn and then they died that's how most stories end and I, one of the things you said in the book was that they laugh at times when you know it's not funny it's like a it's a really sour note in the in the story and they they're laughing out loud or and i think that was the native american uh, uh um some of the native americans that you had met had done the same thing. oh yeah that was that's yeah that felt very similar i was at a family gathering a Lakota family gathering and everyone was laughing at this racist messaging, which I guess, and I was sort of struck by that, but, um, but I get it. I tend to personally laugh. I didn't write this in the book, but I tend to laugh when things are really hard. Um, I think it's coping. It's, it's maybe inherited, you know, intergeneration a response to, to trauma anyway. So I grew up hearing stories about my ancestors on the South Dakota Prairie. And I was always really, really intrigued and enthralled with these stories. I had an Uncle Louie who could stand on the back of a horse. I had um, had a cousin who would clear a path of rattlesnakes between the claim shack and the outhouse every morning when he was five. Um, I had the, the greatest hit, the story that weirdly all the women like to tell is in particular, and they call it a cute story. Do you want to hear a cute story? Uh, is about my great great grandmother who would arm her her daughters in the middle of winter in South Dakota, which was very cold. She would have, give them an axe or a stick of wood and send them out into the winter. I always picture that it's blizzarding to crack the ice of the creek behind the house. She would then dunk herself naked in that water. This was her mikvah, which is a ritual bath that religious Jewish women do to mark the end of their menstrual cycles. And I just find it so fascinating that that's, the, that, like I started to see this pattern that the stories I was told were really teaching tools. I think that's true in families. And and what are the, what are the values that I'm, that I'm supposed to be learning here? 
There's something about toughness. There's something about family commitment. There's something about religious commitment. And yet I've been a reporter covering the American West for a really long time. And I've written throughout that time about Native America. And I I realized somewhat embarrassingly late in my career that, wait a minute, my family's land was very close to the Lakota's land. And in fact, was, had been Lakota land. Like, why didn't we have any stories about our Lakota neighbors? And so I finally got very curious about the white space around the edges of those stories. And and I, I say this directly, maybe in the book, but that like, I, what are the stories we tell? But what are the stories we don't tell? And why don't we tell those stories? Those are really the questions that propelled me to dig into my own family history in a deeper way. And I, I think one of the things that you do really well is you wind up weaving those two stories together through your own travels. But before we get to those, tell me about your family that comes from Eastern Europe. The and let me let me get this right. I'm guess I'm Sinekin. Is that how you you say the last Sinekin. name? Sinekin. Sinekin. Okay. Tell me about the Sinekins and let's talk about the the push factors. What pushes them out of Eastern Europe? Yeah, I love that question. So my great great grandfather Harry Sinekin. He is living in Odessa with his father and his uncle, and there's a horrible pogrom in 1881. And for those people who don't know what a pogrom is, pogrom comes from a Russian word, which means both to conquer and to destroy. And they were sort of acts of vigilante justice, quote unquote justice, leveraged against Jews throughout Eastern Europe. Interestingly, um, Isabel Wilkerson in her book, Cast, uses the same term to describe vigilante action towards Blacks in America, um, this word pogrom. But anyway, my uh, my great-great-grandfather gets caught up in one of these pogroms. Caught up is sort of a weird term to use, to be honest, because that sounds so passive. But um, soldiers or Russian peasants, they, um, they storm his house where he is. He hides under the bed, but they break all the furniture. They break all the mirrors. They find my great great grandfather. They beat him, break every one of his ribs, leave him probably for dead, and they set fire to the house. He escapes somehow, but he told my great aunt, who's still alive, when she was a little girl, he like put her on his lap and he's like, See this scar on my nose? That's from the pogrom that I was in. It's a heartwarming family story to share. And he leaves. Odessa, no one ever hears anything else about his father or uncle. So I sort of presume they died. And he goes back to his mother. His parents had been, gotten divorced, um, weirdly, because she, my, his father wasn't religious enough or something. So anyway, she goes back to Capulia, where his mother has remarried and has three new children. And Capulia is in what is today Belarus. But it was in the time called the the Pale of Settlement. They didn't call it a reservation. They called it the Pale of Settlement. This is an area where Jews were constrained, where Jews had to live. And they had very, um, eco there was a lot of economic oppressive conditions. So Jews couldn't own land. My great-great-grandfather was trained as a smith, but he's not allowed to join the gold or the silver guilds. He can't work with fancy metals as a Jew. He has to work with tin. Um, Soldiers would routinely come through town and they had no barracks, so they would just stay with people. And the women were always worried they would be raped because that would happen. And Jewish young boys would be often conscripted to join the army. And the story is that Jews were always put at the very front of the wars, which was somewhat of a death sentence. So there were all these, there was real physical fear, there was economic constraints. And so when America, I know this is so much of the theme of this podcast, is this time period, which is exactly when all these Jews are fleeing because of this, these pogroms, because of the economic constraints. Really, it's initially, it's more the economic conditions that are driving Jews to leave. Increasingly, this violence gets worse and worse. And so more and more people leave just for their physical safety. Um but my great great grandfather follows his younger brother and he comes to America and he doesn't stop in New York or the East Coast where so many Jews fleeing, you know, hundreds of thousands, really millions by the 1920s have left Eastern Europe, come to America. He doesn't stay in New York. 
he takes the railroad as far as it goes, which is Sioux City, Iowa. And there are so many Jews from the same 2,000 person shtetl living in Sioux City. There's even a synagogue called Ansha Kapulia for the name of this shtetl in Russia. But at some point, he sees signs that advertise free land for the taking. And he writes to my great grandmother, whose great great grandmother is still in Russia, there's free land. Do you think I should take it? And we all think they had no idea what this land really was and that they must have pictured it like a dacha, like these like relaxing cottages in in the woods that that the Russian nobles would go to. And she says, you know, you have bad health. That would be good for your health. You should do it. Get that free land. (laughs) Anyway. Well, the free land too is it's curious because you say in the book as well that your family weren't farmers. I mean, there's not a whole long history there. I mean, they get involved in ranching eventually, but when you think about the the pull factor, the opposite of why they're leaving, but what's drawing them to South Dakota, it's not farming, you know, this land. It's just that I guess there is land there, right? And this is a, a fresh start. I mean, the pull of land was so strong for them. You're exactly right. They weren't really farmers. My great great grandmother's family had been had owned a dairy, but they weren't allowed to own the land. And so the idea that you could own land as a Jewish person in America was so powerful. My great grandmother and her sister apparently referred to the the land as the good earth. This was a long time before Pearl Buck wrote her book, The Good Earth. They they felt more American because they were landowners, because they were able to farm and eventually ranch. Um, there is some research that shows that for especially Jewish immigrants, being homesteaders allowed them to sort of shake off their suspect immigrant status. They looked more like everyone else because they were homesteaders, more like every other white person anyway. Yeah, no, that, there's that big distinct, distinction there. We do need to talk about Native Americans, because when your family comes to South Dakota, um, the state, a lot of the state was the Lakota Nation, or what the Lakota had expected through the treaties to be their land, um, not necessarily where where your family were. But you you mentioned that Harry came months after the Wounded Knee Massacre, that that his immigration happens or coincides with that. Is that right? His brothers, his you know, brothers, his brother, okay. his brother, who's the first member of my family to come. It's about six months after Wounded Knee, he arrives in this country. Yeah. So w- when those two brothers come over, what's their experience of of the plains? Well, they become peddlers, which was a job that a lot of Jews had initially, and it was not a great job to have. Um, and their experience of the plains. Do you mean when they get their when they first? when Harry first gets the land? Well, I just, I imagine it, it must be very strange for them arriving in the United States and and discovering, in a sense, this place that Harry was at, their brother. And wh- what are their impressions of South Dakota? I don't know. No one, so I was sitting on an incredible trove of original family documents. I had literally, in one weekend, scanned a thousand pages of original letters and documents in my great aunt Edda's house. Her house is like a museum, a family museum. There's so many photographs. My, but Harry and his brother, I found only a few letters written in Yiddish from them and they're from much later. So I don't have a sense of what they're, I can't answer that. No, that's fair enough. I, I think that is hard, obviously. And they're there too, they're conversing. So finding letters about their personal, they're, they're not writing diaries at that stage about you know their personal reflections. But, but but I can share that when Harry's son, Jack, shows up in America, which was about 1905, the entire family is all here by 1906. And they're all out on the prairie shortly thereafter. You know, by 1908, according to the records I found at the National Archives, they plant their first crop in 1908 on the South Dakota prairie. But it's likely they, it seems like they had the land before that. Um, And Jack reported he lived into the 80s. And um, we have a gene in my family, I think, to be curious about this history. So I really benefited from that. My cousin wrote a screenplay about my Uncle Jack's life. And she had interviewed him in, in the 80s before he died. And she shared her notes from that interview with me. And Jack told her that when he showed up, he was this young boy. He was only 12. His dad was incredibly erratic. We we all think he probably had a traumatic brain injury from that beating in the pogrom. He was like standing at night in the sod shack that they lived in, 
and he would stare out looking for Cossacks, thinking Cossacks like this, you know, these people were coming to get him and he would have a gun and he was, he would yell all night at them. He, um, I found letters later from describing him beating his wife on the prairie and, and having her pass out for hours from this beating. I mean, he, he was traumatized. It, it was important to me to talk about the pogrom because you see the ripples throughout time and throughout history of of that event and in in sort of so many ways not just that it pushed my family to move but the conditions under which then they were finding themselves here in America um were challenged there's there's a story that Jack told my cousin Kathy that they lived in the nicest one of the nicest houses in Capulia which I'm sure wasn't that nice but um they come to America and and Harry's living in a cave out on the land that's what he's living in and his wife, Fega Etka, says, the one with the mikvah and the ice bath, she says, I'm not coming until you build me a house. But when they get out there, it's not a house as she would have imagined. It's a sod house. So it's a house made from dirt and wood and roots are sticking up out of it. And it, I mean, I can't imagine how dirty and smelly those things would have been. Sleeping in a cave does not sound like a romantic immigrant experience. Um and no. so your great great grandmother Fega Etka, I want to come back to her because she's a fascinating character, and you've only scratched the surface with the story about her uh, bathing herself in the ice cold water. But I, I want to return to like those experiences uh, for the for the early immigrants, the first immigrants, you know that, and and you know your your family all arriving in 1905, because Jews would have found anti-Semitism on the American frontier, as well as in the big cities on the East Coast. And I had never seen some of the images in your book. So that one about the Yiddish cowboy, I thought was brilliant. I had never seen this. Um, it features in the book. It's a it's a it's basically a poster from a, a, a sound or, or a score of some sort, I guess. But I was I wasn't surprised to see the the brandish racism, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what sort of your family faced in terms of anti-Semitism on the frontier. So I'll say that again, something I was found really fascinating, and that I found in my reporting, people for the most part don't like to be described as victims. So even though, you know, the anti-Semitism my family faced, and I will go back to that, you know, it continues into the 30s. And my Aunt Etta would tell me stories that on the one hand, she's telling me, I only really experienced anti-Semitism one time. I never really experienced it. On the other hand, she's telling me how when they would go out to dinner in the 40s, her and her family in Minnesota, they would whisper if they were going to talk about anything Jewish. They didn't They didn't seem Jew. They were Jewish in the house. There's so clearly this fear of being seen as Jewish that continues. And yet it's not what's talked about. So again, what are the stories we tell? What are the stories we don't tell? There's less stories about the victimization they experience. I think because no one wants to feel like they're a victim. That's not the narrative they want to pass on. They want to pass on like a plucky, tenacious narrative. But that's not to say I didn't find a lot of evidence in my research of anti-Semitism. So, yeah, I mean, Harry really struggles in America to get work. He hates that he's working as a peddler. Here he's been trained. He's been trained as like a craftsman and, and he can make all sorts of things with tin. He had real status in Russia. He can't get jobs for a really long time. Eventually, he gets work redesigning a meatpacking plant and he's and it really helps his sense of self he calms down um he feels more proud but mostly he can't get that kind of work there is what i describe as jew face all over the frontier and there's all sort of sort of messaging baked in there was a, a local history that i found where in sioux city these people won't no one will they they describe in this local history of a community out, right on the outskirts of Sioux City that all these Jewish people start businesses and none of the non-Jews will frequent these businesses. And they say very directly, it seems as our, our people will not you know, support a Jewish business. They say it somewhat more craftily than that. And, and yeah, all of these songs are on the radio. There's all this vaudeville that depicts Jews as an incredibly stereotypical 
fashion as as having large noses, being very bumbling. Um, they don't know what they're doing. They're money grubbing. But what's also what complicates this narrative is that so many people who would go to these plays just and, you know, sort of skits describing Jews in this way. So many of the people buying the music that described Jews as this way, they were Jews themselves. They thought it was funny. And they were often these plays, even though they were definitely started initially by Gentiles, non-Jews. In the end, it's a lot of Jews acting in these vaudeville skits and, you know, writing these, producing these vaudeville plays. So I find that really interesting. It, but it was like I interviewed Jody Rosen actually put together, he's a New York Times cultural critic, and he put together an album called Jewface, which has all of these different songs in an album that you can listen to uh, from this time that are incredibly anti-Semitic and problematic. But he said, you know, it was useful. It was a useful thing for your great grandfather to sit in, you know, sit and watch a play and, and be able to laugh at the bumbling Jew on stage. That act of laughing helps him feel more American, more assimilated. He can say, I'm not that bad. I am, I look, it makes me look good. It makes me think of like all the television we watch today of such dysfunctional families that make us feel like, well, I'm okay. I'm not like, I'm not looking like, I'm not that bad of a mom, you know? Yeah, I do know. I do know. And I think those stereotypes being played out by the people that are, you know, basically the 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 butt of the joke, so to speak, um, is that's an incredible layer of the story that I never would have thought was was there. And then you add this layer, I guess, of the white space, as you called it earlier on, between Native Americans and Jewish immigrants, or it could be any immigrant, really. Um, because there's the creation of whiteness in this time. The Irish are going through the same thing. As I as I talked to you today from Ireland, the, the Irish went through that, the sort of whitening process where they've started out as barbarians in, in, the, in the political yes. cartoons and drunks, and they become respectable um, through some process of uh, magic, right? Make-believe. Um, but the Native Americans, they, they're not in the same position. The Native American communities on the plains are perpetually seen as others right for sure so in in as i understand it in europe the dividing line i'm sure there's more dividing lines in this but the dividing line that was important to my family was are you jewish or non-jewish and they come to america and suddenly it's it's color that matters and whiteness is graded on a curve but Jews are white enough. And, you know, not all Jews, just a tiny PSA, like not all Jews are white. But my, aunt, you know, my Ashkenazi Jewish family, they certainly looked white. I look white enough. And um, and so they passed. They had like suddenly this like status elevator that came to them just because of coming to a new country. And, and yet Native people even though their skin might have been the same color as my family's, uh, they they are not white. And um, they they're at the same time that there's these Jew face shows that are all over, there's the Buffalo Bill show, which at the time was like, it was sort of the biggest spectacle like the Super Bowl halftime show. It was analogous to that. And, and there was incredible stereotype and racism just on display in these, these Buffalo Bill shows where they would tour the country, they would tour the world actually, and they would depict frontier scenes and they would show over and over again Native people as brutal, as needing to be squelched by the white man, and these kind of celebrations of what we would call today genocide of Native people. But again, complicating those factors was the fact that Buffalo Bill himself would hire Lakota and other Native people to star in these shows. It was some of the only work they could get outside the reservation at the time. And I mean, according to first town accounts, they were treated well um, by Buffalo Bill. So it's it's I like how messy it is, actually. Yeah, it's incredibly messy. And I think the, the rights issue as well is messy as well. I mean, um, Jewish immigrants are given citizenship. Native Americans have to go through that process of becoming American through allotments and through the land, which is why I think your story is so important as well, is because it demonstrates the value of land. You become a homesteader, you become a citizen. And the same option is kind of available for Native Americans, but 
the hoops that they have to jump through are so so different from from others. I found this a historian who works on Standing Rock helped me to know about this mini play that was written by the Department of the Interior in the 19 teens. I think it was like 1915 was written and he he writes this play a ritual called the arrow for the plow in which native people who are willing to get their land out of trust and put into private property where they have to start paying taxes on their land they are they go through this ceremony where they have to give up their native name and take a white name they literally put their hand on a plow at one point and they say the the i will become a white man and the white man lives to work it's so depressing <laughs> and um and then they're given their citizenship it was this lure like if you will put your land in private property status you get to be a citizen and have the rights that citizenship affords but what the united states absolutely 100% knows when they're doing this, putting Native land in private property, is that 80% of people whose land gets put in property quickly lose their land because they have no cultural experience with paying taxes, with what it means. To, I mean, not that they don't know how to farm and take care of land. They 100% know how to do that. But they 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 very quickly, for, for many reasons, they end up selling their land um, and usually for pennies on on the dollar for far less than they would be getting if they were not native. And again, it's because some of them don't speak English. Um, they're relying on other people to do the deals for them who aren't acting in their best interest. So, I mean, one of the things that I really liked about your writing as well is that you don't pull any punches here, which is, um, I think it's not only the sign of a really good investigative journalist, but I think it's also the sign of someone who's willing to kind of stand by their convictions and and say it as they see it, which is is not always the case in in writing. But you called American expansion westward, obviously at the expense of indigenous peoples, you called it a Holocaust at, at several points in the book. And that's a pretty heavy and you know loaded word, especially for Jewish people the world over. And I think in academia, we dissect words all the time, and it's like not a problem to, to go through that process. But when you do it in the public sphere, it tends to be a little bit more problematic because I don't think people think about word meaning as frequently. But I just thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about why you decided to use the word and describe in the same way that you do in the book, America's expansion and what it means to you. Okay, another just like super easy, quick. I question. know, I know, but you wouldn't be here if it was going to be easy. <laughs> um, it's not easy. It's a it's a great read for that reason. Thank you. I mean, um, so I would say the reason I use the word Holocaust is because that is how Lakota people who I met over and over again describe it themselves. I was I remember I'll never forget it was raining outside. I was in the car. I was driving home from some sort of schlepping of kids and. Doug Whitebull, this Lakota elder who I've come to know, called me and he said, you know, last night I was listening to these Holocaust survivors on the radio and I immediately thought of your family. It was the day after Holocaust Remembrance Day. He said, you know, America should con condemn the Nazis. Why doesn't it condemn itself? We had a Holocaust here. It lasted 400 years and no one ever talks about it. And that's true. I had an, a really excellent education. And I was obsessed with the Holocaust growing up. I was, it was very, now I have a kid who also is obsessed with the Holocaust. It's super unnerving. Um, he like wants me to read him from Anne Frank all the time. He's in third grade. It's weird. But I was that same kid. And yet I never knew until Doug Whitebull told me that, that Native people consider this a Holocaust, that 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 actually Hitler himself was inspired by native by America's treatment of native people for how to treat Jews. So there's there was all these like echoes that were really shocking to me. And I don't think, you know, even though it's not the history we tell in schools, or it certainly wasn't the history I heard growing up, it's just what is when you read it. It was a clear effort by America that was justified legally with language in the newspapers to say, first of all, manifest destiny, which was the the, the term used that was a, it was coined by a newspaper man and it was picked up and used by presidents and congressmen alike to justify 
the expansion of America across the land to say, if you are Christian and you are spreading Christianity, then you not only have are justified, you're doing good by taking land from non-Christian people to overspread the continent, I think was the language that was used. And so for a long time, that gets used to just justify the killing, direct killing of, of indigenous peoples in America. And then uh, that becomes too expensive. Having all of these soldiers in the field, on the plains, where it's cold, where it's very hot, um, getting them food, that's really expensive. And they realize this will be better for the national wallet is a, a process of let's just assimilate native people to the point where they they don't need land anymore what is today called cultural genocide um how do we and again i use that word cultural genocide because clearly that's what they were doing there was a clear effort to eradicate native culture rel native religions become illegal practicing native ritual becomes illegal at no point is anyone telling my family now that you're in America, you have to braid your last holla. You have to change your name. But that is exactly what is being done at the same exact time my family is here, is arriving and settling in America. That's exactly what is being done to Native people, their Native neighbors. And their children are being taken. Native children are taken away from their families and put in boarding schools, ideally as far away from their communities as possible, so that they will no longer learn their own religion or culture or language there as you probably know they're made to wear white quote unquote white clothes they're often these places are run by missionaries or military people the conditions are very bad um many many children die in these places and and no one is expecting kids at these schools to like become the next president or a doctor they only go to school half the day the rest of the day they're learning what's called an industrial education how can they have jobs that are no longer reliant on land? So the girls are taught ironing and dishwashing. How can they become domestic servants? The boys are often taught, sometimes they're taught farming, but they're also taught carpentry skills. And one of the most heartbreaking details that I learned was so many children are dying in these schools and it's the kids in the carpentry shop that make their coffins when they die, when these kids die. I mean, it's heartbreaking. And, and you say, as you probably know, but actually my introduction to the Midwest and West is, is only recent. And we I've recently brought my kids on a trip through North Dakota and we we went to uh, many sites of of importance, like, you know, places where uh, where, where Native Americans send smoke signals and, and, you know, looking over Medicine Hole and the Kildare Mountains. And stuff. I had very little exposure as an East Coast person. I had I had no idea about the boarding schools until I met Denise Lejim O'Dear, the poet laureate of North Dakota, whose parents were in a boarding school and explained how they uh, how they worked. So, and I, I don't think I knew all about allotment policy the way I did after being and living in in the Midwest. So, um, I think just to interrupt you, I don't think even people living in the Midwest know it. Like, according to the more recent research I found of the schools that do even teach anything to kids about, you know, K through 12 public schools that teach anything about Native America, 98% don't teach anything after 1900, which allotment is is that time period. So you weren't alone just because you weren't in the region. Sorry to interrupt you. No, not at all. I, I, I thank, thank you for that. Um... I wanted to ask you about women too, because you've got you've got this great great grandmother. I'm right, great great two greats. Um, two greats. I've got a great one too, who I talk about in there. But yes, two greats is where I start. Right. This is uh, Vega Etka, who yeah. uh, is seems just such a remarkable woman, and she dominates the sort of moral narrative of the book. And I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about her and about women on the frontier at this time, whether they, they be Jewish immigrants or immigrants generally or, or Native American women and their importance for how everything works. She seems to me, from what I can tell, like she was an incredibly fierce um, and loving and beloved person. Her children really loved her and um, kind of protected her, looked out for her a lot, worried about how she didn't, she really wanted to keep her Jewish rituals 
intact. And that was hard to do on the prairie. So she only ate kosher meat and meat has to be then blessed ceremonially by a rabbi who is trained to do what's called koshering meat. And she uh, ritual like killed in a certain meat would be killed in a certain way. So she got really thin on the prairie. She didn't eat a lot. Um, she was fighting with a kind of erratic husband a lot, but she was incredibly she seems like she was incredibly bright. She had been taught, unlike many Jewish women, she was taught school by her older brothers. She ran the business when my when they had a business back in Russia, she she kept the books. And um she was known as someone who was like could do anything. And one of the things that she could do was she told her sons, you not you not only do you have to be rich in America and successful, you have to become multi-millionaires. And it wasn't until I really studied for this book project the history of Jewish people that I under that I think I understand now why. Because you see throughout the history, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that Jews live in Europe over and over again, they get exiled, they get expelled from one country to the next. And yet wealthy Jews were often allowed to stay longer. There's even certain laws that were written in Spain and Portugal that would say, made a provision. Okay, everyone has to leave except for the rich Jews, they can stay. Eventually they had to leave too. And so I think that Fega Etka was, this was about not so much about ambition. This was about safety and security. How do I keep my family intact in this strange new land? How do I make sure we don't have to be kicked out? And she knew, she said to her children, never sell the land. You will make money. The land, there is value and wealth in this land. And she was 100% right. Um, how did she know that? I don't know. Um, women on the prairie had a really hard life. I mean, they're having to cook and farm and clean and oh my god it was it was very difficult and it was lonely um even though my family is settling in an area that locals to this day still call Jew Flats even though no Jew has lived there in a very long time my family sells the ranch ultimately my family has like almost 6000 acres there by the 50s but but my grandmother and her sister sell the last bit of that land in 1970 which was before i was born but you know they they weren't in like a huge shtetl right there it was these islands of jews even there were about 70 jewish people living in this area um in the early 1900s when they all become homesteaders together but they're they're sometimes like a mile apart from each other, two miles apart. And the land, as you know, it goes straight up and then it goes straight down. It is it is not like they had cars and they were driving to each other's houses for tea. So it was a lonely, isolated life. Her, her daughter, Rose, wrote this 31-page letter to her nieces, including my grandmother that, I, that was kept and that I have now, describing life. Uh, the what it was like, and it was so lonely. She was a like a teenager on the prairie. It was very lonely, she said, and hard. Rose wanted to grow up and become a secretary, and that was not something that would be easy to learn how to do when you're on the prairie. But I think for women, there's a really wonderful book called "Prairie Dogs Weren't Kosher" that was written about Jewish homesteaders. Uh, and I, I would recommend it about the lives of women there. There weren't, I want to make clear to listeners, even though my book is about Jewish homesteaders, there were only about a thousand, which is a lot. There were a thousand Jewish homesteaders in the early 1900s in the Dakotas, but that's really like a half of 1% of all of the homesteaders in the Dakotas. So we're talking about kind of a niche moment in history. It's niche, but I, I think part of the reason that makes it so important and the, the way your book is written is that it transcends a lot of the major questions in the American experience, whether it be about race and religion, immigration, obviously the importance of land and economy. And, and speaking of economy as well, I mean, I know uh, this show is about the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, but the your family's history then moves on from uh, homesteading to 
bigger and better prospects. I mean, in in Le- uh, lead in and Deadwood, uh, your your family, Jake Cosber, a top business person, and he has a, a tavern and a liquor business. And um, so there's the the, the family develops um, whole new avenues of prominence in the area, right? Absolutely, but the land was part of that. I think that's important to point out. I I pulled all the mortgages that my family took out on their land. I pulled all the deeds. I pulled all the mortgages. And I started to see this pattern when I compared it to what I was learning from newspaper, old newspaper clippings and letters and journals, is they would take out a mortgage and then they would start a new business that wasn't reliant on land. Or they would take out a mortgage and they would expand their land holdings. Or they would take out a mortgage and they would keep the land on the prairie, but they would move. Um, And so there is real value there. And one of the things, yes, my great grandfather, Jake Cosberg, who was not a Senecan, well, he was kind of Senecan, he was a cousin, which is very weird. Uh, But he and he ends up marrying Ruth Senecan. And those are my great grandparents, both of them homesteaders together on the prairie. But yeah, he, he gets into he, he goes to Deadwood and lead. And he starts out as a cold, a gold miner, and he does not last long because, as he tells his daughter, my aunt Etta, it was no place for a good Jewish boy to be deep underground. And he start, he says to her, you know, what what did people want to spend their money on? They wanted wine and women, and I was not about to open a brothel. That's how he said it. And so he um, he got into the liquor business, and he did incredibly well in the liquor business until prohibition comes into place. And South Dakota is one of the first states in the country to pass prohibition before it's a national law. And it's at that point that he and my great grandmother and my grandmother, who's a baby, moved to Minnesota where where prohibition isn't in place yet. And they have a new liquor store there until the, until the national law comes into place. Yeah. Prohibition sounds like it hits your family pretty hard. And it seems like that that's a big turning point. Of course, uh, Jewish Americans were able to get a, a license for wine. I think I don't know how much wine it was, but I remember reading that prohibition that Irish people, and I think your book mentions this briefly, that Irish people actually try and change their faith or or they do. They convert to Judaism uh, in order to get access to the, you know, the provision for for wine. So that that was fascinating. Just going back to your 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 existence as a journalist as well. I mean, you write about Western peoples, and you travel in this story. You you travel with Doug Whitebull uh, to some places of importance to his family, graves and 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 former land that he owned. And I know I focused a lot on the early 20th century because that's what this podcast is all about. But how does the story of your family and the Whitebull families play out in the years after World War II and in the early 21st century? So after World War II, um, you know, we have several, we have all these people in my family, all these cousins who are war heroes and come home. And I think my family is is still really looking to look American, to be American. There's people have Christmas trees in their homes um, and they're still having their traditions. They're, they're also passing those down. But my family's for the most part off the prairie and living in St. Paul, Minnesota, and having jobs. You know, my great grandfather has a liquor store. There's lots of people who have liquor stores, and they're in businesses, and they're they're living a kind of quote unquote middle class, upper middle class life. Um, my uncle Louis goes back to the Dakotas, and he wants to to make a million dollars as his mother told him to on the land and he he and his relatives create an oil and gas company and they work really hard to make a million dollars off the land and they fail at it with really a little relieved that they didn't make a lot of money in the oil and gas business because um I know about the harms that can be attended with that business um but but they try and but because also they're immigrants who don't know what they're doing who have no experience in the oil and gas business they 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 don't do it very well they make a lot of mistakes um but that's all to say that's kind of the the trajectory that my family is on okay so they're they're like assimilated their kids are going to public school they're doing great um but for the white family who have had so much of their land taken from them 
I, and based on my research and a Josh Mizell, who's at Haskell University, who helped me look at a bunch of mapping, you know, between 1851, which is a treaty that the United States signs with the Lakota, promising them a certain amount of land to have in perpetuity, and 1908, when my family plants their first crop, the United States has taken or stolen, and I use the word stolen intentionally, I mean, the, the Supreme Court actually even said, yes, we stole this land. I'm from the from the Lakota, um, they they take 98 percent of the land that the United States had said was for the Lakota in 1851. And as I write in the book, that land that effort to take land, it, it's ongoing. So in the 50s, the United States sets up a series of dams on the Missouri River. It's done for flood control, but the dams also flood certain communities. And people talk about how the, the largest brunt of that flooding was borne by native communities. In Cheyenne River Reservation, 30% of the people living there have to, to move and they have to move inland away from the river. And most, for the very most of them, the land they get is never as good as the land they had along the river. And the White Bull family, that is certainly true. There is this, this wonderful line in a book from a an elder who said, the, the, on the new land, even the jackrabbits out here have to bring, have to pack their lunch. So um, Doug and his family, you know, they just, they once again have lost their land and they're once again reestablishing themselves in a new place. That's only, you know, it's, it's dozens of miles away from where they had been living. But once again, they're sort of starting, starting over and their land um, Doug talked about these this thing called a forced fee patent, which I almost hate to even say because it's so bureaucratic sounding and what does that mean? But the bottom line is the United States does this thing that I talked sort of referenced earlier around that arrow for the plow ceremony, but it's this effort to put native land in and take it out of trust where it can't be sold and put it in private property where it can. And if you looked more assimilated, if you looked more white, the United States would do what was called forced fee patent. They would forcibly put your land without your consent. They would take your land and put it in private property. And a lot of people, including soldiers who fight in wars, come home like World War One, World War Two. They come World War One. They come home. And suddenly they've lost their land because without them knowing it, while they've been off defending America in the war, their land has been put into private property status. The county has been sending them tax bills. They haven't paid their tax bills because they've been fighting in the war and the land's been taken away because they hadn't paid their taxes. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that this reminds me of is a talk that I had with TJ Styles earlier on this show and, and in, in person uh, about the way that the Reconstruction Constitution in the United States may have created new freedoms and liberties for American citizens, certainly, you know, uh, freeing the slaves, emancipating enslaved peoples. and But for Native Americans, it really restricted their idea of what sovereignty was. And it, it's not really been recovered. And land has so much to do with that. I want to bring it all full circle, if I can. Um, we started off with a really tough question. I think this is equally tough, but one that I can convince that you can answer as as well as you do in the book. Um, you have this kind of call to action in the final pages of the book. It's not as blunt or direct as that, but I, I read it as a call to action. And you say, our failure to teach American history in its full and nuanced complexity leads to ignorance, which saps empathy and allows racism and hatred to flourish which keeps our caste system in place, which keeps marginalized people poor and disenfranchised, which allows the dominant class to maintain historical narrative that is inaccurate in its simplicity. So how do we stop, as you put it, this cycle of harm? How do we stop it? And I know that you're, you can say that like writing history like this is one way that we can do it, but I'd love to hear other ideas that you have of how we stop the cycle of harm. So I studied at the guidance of an indigenous elder and judge who said to me, listen, if you're going to look at this history, you need to study your own culture. What did, what did the Jews say about how to respond to a harm, even one you didn't directly commit, but one you benefited from? And that's that set me on like a couple years of studying with my rabbi here in town, Benjamin Barnett, 
ancient Jewish texts that look at atonement and repentance and repair and contemporary rabbis who are studying those same texts for guidance on how to respond, you know, how to how to think about those old texts in a new way that helps us as one rabbi, Toba Spitzer, put it, you know, can grapple with the original sins of America, which is the theft of native land and the enslaving of people. <laughs> and so I, I say all that because it's important to me to share that it, my response is really grounded in my own culture. And I also spoke with Lakota elders who who helped me to grapple with like what can be done. And, and what I was told over and over again was like, telling the truth is is healing actually and and studying these truths together in conversation is really healing seeing each other for all of our own foibles and beauties is is really a a great thing <laughs> it's not a great thing let's say that again like it's a it's really powerful and so yes i think knowing this history in its full messy context nuanced way is really important um but Maimonides who was a Jewish philosopher who wrote this kind of irritating but but also beautiful ste certain steps for how to do repentance in the 16th century I, it still holds up today in my opinion and and so the first step he lays out is stop doing the harm and I think you can argue that in America we're we haven't really stopped harming Native people. There are so many Native people in America who live without really basic human rights. Who of the ten poorest counties in America, four of them are in the Dakotas on Native reserve Lakota reservations. Um, there's more. There's all these different steps. I can get into them if you want. And and one of them is how do you how do you attend to the harm in a way that is sufficient to the person who's been harmed. Obviously, a lot of Native people would like their land back. And there is this whole land back movement. My family doesn't have any land to give back anymore. So what, what are we supposed to do? And I hate to sort of center the work of my family, but because um, there are a lot of examples out there of ways that the communities at the local level are starting to grapple with, are starting to think about this and starting to put action behind words. You know, we, I don't know if, if this happens where you live, but in, in the West, there's all these land acknowledgements. I mean, my God, before my goddaughter's like dance performances, there's an acknowledgement of the land that, right. But, but that can feel to me increasingly kind of just like woke signaling, like what are, is that useful? And I'm increasingly curious about how do we make what Native people have called to me a gift? How do we not only acknowledge the land, but but give a gift back? Because they say, we gave you that land. That was our gift. And so, you know, I've wondered if my own synagogue, every time we do a land acknowledgement, can we put five bucks in a jar and have a Native organization that we're partnering with that we, sh we give that money to? Um, and I ended up following the guidance of Doug White Bull and other elders, Lakota elders, I started a family fund that is housed at an indigenous-led nonprofit that has been doing this work for 30 years. I think it's really important that as non-indigenous people, we're not inventing the wheel here. We're just following the work and the guidance that's already happening that Native people are putting in place. But this Indian Land Tenure Foundation for 30 years has been helping Native nations recover their land. And as private land sales come up, they are buying land and holding it in trust or the native nation is holding it for their people. And they are working in the Black Hills, which for the Lakota is their spiritual home. It is how many Jews consider Israel as their spiritual home. Um, and and the, the United States stole that land. And that's the, the Supreme Court ruling I referenced earlier that the, the showed that the Black Hills were stolen. And the, and the Supreme Court ruled, OK, we have to pay you for it. But the Lakota, who are among the poorest people in America, said, we don't want that money. We want the land. So my family, anyway, there's a long way to say one thing that my family's doing is, is, is donating to this fund that helps re re reclaim that land. It's called the Hey Sapa Land Recovery Fund. Anyone can donate to it. 
I've set our fundraising goal at $1.1 million, which is the amount when adjusted for inflation that my family received in mortgages on our free land and that helped us build so much of our wealth. And I understand from your acknowledgments in the book that part of the whatever you receive is uh, advances or royalties for the book will will go towards either that fund or I guess, is it another fund as well that you're contributing that? Well, there I I I write in the acknowledgments that really the whole book could be seen as a land acknowledgement to the Lakota, but um, because my indigenous friends have taught me that it, it's that these acknowledgments are best when having a little action behind them. Yeah, I've donated some money to um, this organization, the Intertribal Buffalo Council, which is helping to bring buffalo back to the Lakota, but also 80 or so other indigenous nations throughout the, the Great Plains. And I also acknowledge in the book the people in Oregon on whose land I live and whose land I, you know, where I wrote most of the book. And so I also donated some money to Seeding Justice, which is an Indigenous-led nonprofit here in town, which is helps support the work of all of the Native nations here in Oregon. I think it's important for listeners to hear about this too, because this is not, I mean, you mentioned land acknowledgements and there is signaling or virtue signaling as they say, right? But um, your work has got real action behind it. I find you to be an inspiring journalist and an inspiring writer, because obviously we all have these personal stories. My family are Italian immigrants. Um, most Americans have stories like this and the way they interconnect with others is it's it's an important and, as you point out, powerful way of not only understanding our past, but possibly our future as well and how we get on with each other in the 21st century. So it gives me great hope, your book, that there's there's a you know, there's a brighter future ahead of us. And so for that, thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much. That really means a lot. And it's been really fun talking to you. Thanks for having me. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.